It's, it's my pleasure to be here today. I really want to thank everyone who, who made it possible for me to come and talk to you today. Uh, I love the opportunity to talk to new audiences about this work. And um, it is my view that what we're going to do here today, I'm going to tell you a very big story. And this big story is going to widen up the view just a little bit further than we've heard so far. There's an incredible process unfolding before us right now. We live in some of the most extraordinarily interesting times, and it's my view that they're going to become more interesting. The title of my talk, Unfixable, I truly have come to the conclusion that there is going to be no way for us to return to what we might call normal, what we've just experienced over the past four or five decades that has formed the opinions and shaped the experiences and and, and given our, our current crop of leaders and, and most of the people in this room, the idea of how things work. And it is my view that wh whether you believe me or not, I'm asking you to just consider the data that I'm going to present that hints at the idea that we are entering a period which will be unlike almost any other. Uh, I have this, this book. I have one copy left. Whoever asks the best question gets it. Yeah, a little competition. I love competition. Um, but this book is, is book form of something called The Crash Course, which is an online, it's 20 chapters long, it's, it's three and a half hours of material, which I'm going to cover in about 30 minutes tonight. And um, it's available in Spanish, which was the first full translation that was done by volunteers. It took them over a thousand hours to do a full, full language translation. And you can find that, and it's for free at my website, uh, chrismartinson.com. I can summarize all of my work into this one sentence, which is that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. That's a trite statement. Of course, advances always happen. Things are always a little different. But this is important because as humans, we tend to model what we think is going to happen next on what just happened before. And that's perfectly fine if you're in a long period of relatively stable growth or you're in relatively stable rates of inflation of 2 3% or relatively stable anything. And it is my view that we're coming up on a very sharp corner in history. The future has got a very sharp corner in front of us. And once I adopted this view of the future, it became a lens that I looked through and I found that I couldn't look at the world any other way once I had adopted this view. So what I'd like to do is help take something, I think investing today is an impossible task. I'm going to try and simplify it a little bit in this talk. And it's impossible today because, of course, there is no such thing as investing when we're all speculating about what the Federal Reserve or the ECB is going to do next Tuesday or the next time they meet and convene. We're all speculating about where money is going to go and things like that. Investing has become really, really difficult. And it's done so for a very profound reason, which I hope to um, elucidate. Now, my work centers around three E's. The economy is the first one, and, I, and the economy is the primary lens I focus through. And the reason for that is the economy is how we organize ourselves. It's how we get things done. If we do not have a functioning economy, we will not be able to pursue any of our technological dreams or any of our solutions that we're hoping to prosecute or, or bring to bear. The economy has to be there in order for us to organize ourselves effectively. So we care deeply how our economy is functioning. And it is my view that we can't look at the economy alone anymore. The Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, the people at the ECB, all of the politicians, they just look at the economy as if that was the only thing they had to look at. And the rest will just sort of take care of itself, right? If we make monetary policy right, we pull these levers, somehow the economy will pick itself up and keep moving. And that hasn't been true. And the reason for that, I believe, is because we have to connect the economy to energy. There's an enormous story going on in energy right now that I can show you just data, just facts, very, very simple facts around that I hope will, will lead you to the same conclusions I did, which is that we have to look at both of these two things together now. And in fact, there's a 30, the environment, which we also have to consider at the same time. And so that's what my work is, is putting all three of these E's into one spot because we have to look at them all together now. No longer can we just look at the economy alone. So here's how economists see the world, and um, I hope you all remembered your differential calculus. You didn't? Okay, let me simplify this, this equation for you. There. It's an equation for growth. We need to have growth. You can't read a single statement by a single political leader or monetary leader without hearing the word growth dozens of times. Growth, growth, growth. We need growth in jobs. Bad time to talk about real solutions. We have to get the economy growing first. We need growth. This is what we need. But not just any kind of growth. This equation solves for a type of growth called exponential growth. And I have to talk about that as maybe my fourth E for tonight is exponential growth and what that means because that's the world we live in. And it all begins here with what is money. And I need to 
not spend very much time on this for this audience in particular. We can skip right past this. Um, I don't care what color your money is or what kind of anti-counterfeiting devices you have or which president is on there or anything like that. All money in the world today shares one common characteristic, which is that it's loaned into existence. And what do we know about loans? Well, they have a principal component and they have an interest component. That's the nature of a loan. And when you loan something into existence, like your money supply, you end up with, by definition, an exponential system, a system that grows exponentially. Now, to get exponential growth, it's not hard. All you need to have is something growing by some percentage over a unit of time. And it doesn't have to be a big percentage. A quarter of a percent will do. One percent, three percent, doesn't matter. So, Without going into all the mechanics of it, I can prove to you that we have an exponential system of money, but, but we don't have to go through all the individual steps. We can just back way up and look at the data and see what that tells us. So the key concept of loaning all your money into existence is that at any moment in time, take a snapshot of that economy that's using debt-based money, and you will find more debt in the system than you will find money itself. So in the United States today, there's roughly $52 trillion dollars of credit market debt and about $12 trillion of money, 52 to 12. So this is a feature. You always have more debt than money, and, and, and it uh, has some interesting implications of it that I won't go into completely right now. But one of the things that we can look at this system and understand is this is the chart that I think if I was just given one chart, somebody said, Chris, only one chart. I need you to explain everything about where we are. It's this one. So what we're looking at here is total credit market debt for the United States. And this is everything. This is state debt, federal, local, uh, personal or household debt, corporate debt. It's everything. And what we're seeing here in the red line is uh, information or data from the Federal Reserve. And that red line shows the growth in credit market debt starting in 1970 on your left, all the way on through to current. And what we see there in those little blue upside down pyramids, those triangles, is I've asked the question starting in 1970. How long did it take before credit market debt doubled? Doubled fully. If it was at 100, it went to 200. And if it was at 200, it went to 400. Those sorts of doublings. And it turns out it took about seven years for credit market debt to double from 1970 to 77. And then again, it doubled over the next six or seven years. And then it doubled over the next eight years. And then it doubled over the next 11 years. And the summary is that over four decades, from 1970 to 80 to 90 to the 2000s, credit market debt doubled five times. So if we want the next 10 years to resemble any of those prior four decades, we're going to expect credit market debt to at least double. So that means we have to have the United States go from 52 to $104 trillion of debt from the period 2008 to 2018. Well, here we are three years into that story, and we're nowhere near that at this point in time. So as a past scientist, one other feature of this chart I want to point out, the black line. As a scientist, without understanding the mechanism of a system, if I don't know how the system operates, what I'll do is I'll do something called a curve fit. I'll put a math formula and match it against my data to see if I can understand something about the system. That black line is an exponential curve fit. And here's the thing about curve fits. If you get a value of zero when you fit your curve and you mathematically test it, a value of zero means that there's no explanatory power between your formula and the data. And if you get a value of one, it means it's perfect. So as a scientist, we'd get pretty excited when we'd get a value of around 0.6. And by 0.7, you're really on to something. And by 0.8, you have a rock solid finding that you can take uh, and publish. And by the time you get up to 0.9, you're suspecting frauds involved in the data. <laughs> well, the fit between a perfect exponential curve and our credit market debt growth has a value of 0.9889. We'll round that up to 0.99. It is, ladies and gentlemen, a perfect fit. We do not have to know anything about how money is created or monetary policy or anything to know that we can look at the past four decades of credit growth and say it is a perfectly exponential system. All right. Well, if we look at this and we see that little orange part in the circle, that's the most serious departure in the data set we've ever seen. It started in 2008. If you want to understand everything that's going on, rising food stamp use, uh, riots in Greece, the destruction of, of peripheral economies, if you want to understand why budgets are being destroyed and shredded, why what James Turk showed, that huge departure between revenues and expenditures for governments, all of it is explained in that little tiny wiggle of that red tail that you see circled in orange up there. That explains everything. We have a system that is designed, a money system that is designed to grow exponentially, and for whatever sets of reasons, it hit a limit to growth and it couldn't go any further. We got the little wiggle in the tail and we are now living in history. Um, 
What's the implicit assumption when you look at, of course, debt? Debt doesn't matter. If I have a lot of money, I, how much debt I have doesn't matter. Debt to income matters. How do we measure that? Debt to GDP is a measure of debt to income. So this is United States debt to GDP. And what we notice is that something happened about in the early 1980s, and the debt to GDP ratio just took off in a perfect 45 degree line. And, and everybody in this room kind of grew up on that line. And so that's, we think that's level, that's level territory, you know, because that's how the world works, right? And the implicit assumption that's baked into the idea, if you are constantly, constantly growing your debt relative to your economy, you are making the implicit, if not explicit assumption that the future is going to be larger than the present. Otherwise, this chart makes no sense whatsoever. It means everybody who, is, who has got money in the debt markets is making a very, very flawed assumption and a flawed set of bets that are going to result in an enormous amount of monetary loss. When you see a chart like this, it says that we have collectively, as a society in the United States, but this chart could apply to many countries, we have made the assumption that the future is always going to be larger than the present. And I want to test whether that's true with some other data. And this is all a global phenomenon. Here we're looking at the little blue lines are the stories we tell ourselves in the newspaper. Oh, debt to GDP of Italy, 120%. United States, 89%. Those sorts of numbers. Those are the little blue boxes. But the green boxes are what happens when we include off-balance sheet liabilities, the actual obligations of the nation states. And here we see numbers that are over 250, 300, 400, 500%. There's only one nation that ever, ever grew out from under a debt load of 260%, all-time record winner. That was um, England from the period of uh, 1815 to 1900, grew out from under a 260% a debt load. And it had two things working in its favor. One, the Napoleonic Wars ended, which meant they could decommission and dismantle a very uh, serious expenditure, uh, which they did. And they had this little thing called the Industrial Revolution that <coughs> came along. So in order for these countries to dig out from under those debt loads, we have to imagine something more dramatic than dismantling an entire war machine plus something more dramatic than the Industrial Revolution. It's never been done before. So we don't know what, whether it can be done or not, but you might be skeptical as to whether it can be.